Welcome to this session. My name is Renee McCormick. I'm the Executive Director of Science Programs for the National Math and Science Initiative, and I'm really glad you're here. This particular third installment of the unit on gases, or gas laws if you prefer, is going to be short, much shorter than the rest. I know that makes you happy. Kind of makes me happy too. So I'm going to walk through some of the theory behind this, and the reason for that is you're going to have to write about this stuff. And you need to be able to write intelligently about it. So a lot of the phrasing and the little tidbits of information I'm about to share with you make the difference between you being able to gather points in the essay portions of the various free response questions or be a kind of an also ran. Meaning I didn't win this race, but I tried real hard. No, I don't want that to be the case. I want you to actually win the race. So I'm going to get some of the finer points in your language. So if you enjoy, have enjoyed all the mathematics up to this point, this could be a little bit painful for you. If you have not enjoyed the mathematics up to this point, hey, this section is for you. You're going to like this part. It's far more verbal. So the kinetic theory, kinetic, easy for me to say, right? The kinetic molecular theory of gases is where we basically tie all these pieces together. KMT is what a lot of chemists call it for short according to KMT, the kinetic molecular theory, and there are four assumptions of the model that you should know and be able to recite, and most of this you already do know. You've picked up these tidbits along the way. The first one is, is a, a truth. All the particles are in constant random motion. As long as they're not at absolute zero, they are in constant random motion. It's just that gas molecules are not as attracted to each other, and so they are way more chaotic than molecules in the, the solid or liquid phase. Now this next part is a bit of a stretch. The assumption is made that all of the collisions between these particles are perfectly elastic. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Perfectly elastic means two objects collided and no energy was lost. No sparks, no sound, no crumpling, no damage. That's not going to happen. Now, they may not damage each other, they may just have a glancing blow, but they still are going to lose energy in that collision. So this is probably the biggest assumption of all. The next one is logical, that the volume of the particles in the gas is it, in a gas is negligible. The particles themselves are 2,000 diameters apart, and so that's, that's not a stretch. 2,002 diameters versus 2,000 diameters, it's to one sig fig, 2,000 diameters. So that's a very good assumption. And then the fourth assumption is also a good one. The average kinetic energy of the molecules is its Kelvin temperature. That's where that derivation came from in the beginning. Now, the reason that we make these assumptions has a lot to do with the fact that the theory neglects any intermolecular forces. Intermolecular, between molecules. Interstate highway, between states. Apologies to my Alaska and my Hawaii students who are a bit isolated. Their state is not interconnecting with anyone else's state. But the lower 48 have 48 connecting states, and that's why we have I 35, I-45, I-20. We have these interstate highways. So intermolecular simply means between molecules. And so those forces are those forces that account for these changes in states of matter. When you are taking a solid and warming it, you're giving it more energy to overcome some of those intermolecular forces so that it can melt and become liquid. And then when you keep heating and keep heating and keep heating and keep heating, you're going to add a lot more energy to get it to actually vaporize. Again, you're com overcoming the intermolecular forces that were keeping those molecules close together in the liquid phase. So that means it's important to also note that gases expand to fill their container. But it's not good enough to just say that. You need to go on and say gases expand to fill their container since they are no longer experiencing intermolecular forces. Thus, they are free to move about. Um, solids and liquids are bound together by those intermolecular forces. So gases are very compressible as a result of all that empty space. Solids and liquids, not so much. So we have talked about Boyle's, Charles, Gay-Lussac's, all these different gas laws. This is just the particulate understanding of those laws. So I don't want you to miss multiple choice questions because you don't understand what these little drawings are doing for us. We call those the particulate drawings. So here 
we have the same number of particles in both of these containers. We have one mass, we have two masses, twice as much pressure exerted by that mass, and so it squishes those particles together. So it's decreasing the volume, and what happens then is that the pressure increases because the collisions are more energetic and more often. So if the volume is decreased, then the gas particles are going to hit the walls more often, and that's ultimately going to increase the pressure. We're holding the number of molecules and the temperature constant. And then you know that R is already your good buddy, the ideal constant. So we've got three constants in that, in that set of parentheses. Then we can move on and vary something else. We can say, okay, what about Charles' law? Well, when the gas is heated, so now we're going to change the temperature, then the speeds of the particles increase, so they're going to collide with more oomph more energy. Oomph is my word. Don't write that on the AP exam. You can think it, but don't write it. And thus hit the walls more often with more force. And so the only way to keep the pressure constant is to increase the volume of the container. So note that we have three weights on top of each of one of those cylinders. So the pressure is the same, but this is expanded to twice the volume if we want to keep that pressure the same. If we leave it squished, down like this one is, then there's going to be more pressure. So if you want to hold the pressure constant, you have no choice but to let the container itself expand. Alright, and then we don't want to neglect Gay-Lussac's law. So here, when the temperature of a gas is increased, so temperature is increasing, the speeds of its particles are increased. This is your classic heat them up, speed them up. And because they're running now, instead of just meandering, um, the particles are hitting the wall with a lot greater force and a lot greater frequency. So more energetic collision and more frequent collision. That's a double whammy. And that means that the volume remains the same. This is going to result in a very big increase in pressure. And so it would take three weights versus one weight. So you had to add two more weights to this situation to keep that volume constant. And then Avogadro's law is just, we're going to make it more crowded. Well, if you make it more crowded and you're not changing the volume or the pressure, then you're going to, the collisions are going to literally move that piston upward and increase the volume for you. So an increase in the number of particles at the same temperature caused that pressure to increase. And if the volume were held constant, um, then the only way to keep this constant pressure is to vary the volume. So you can't leave that volume constant if you want, you know, explore this. So to keep the pressure constant, I've got to let that volume change is the bottom line. So make it more crowded, got to give more space for it to run around if you're only going to use one weight as your constant pressure. And then how about Dalton's law? It's the easiest of all, isn't it? The total pressure is equal to the sum of the parts however many different gases you have in there. They're independent of one another. They're not reacting with one another. They're not attracted to one another. So if you keep putting them in there, it's it's kind of just a, a, a fancier version of Avogadro's law. Pressure exerted by a mixture of gases is simply the sum of all of their partial pressures. Don't try to make that complicated because it just isn't. So let's look at molecular speeds. When we talk about distribution of molecular speeds, um, we often do this graphically, but where we plot the number of gas molecules with various speeds versus the speed itself, and you get a curve, a nice little curve. Changing the temperature affects the shape of the curve, but not the number of particles in there, so not the area beneath the curve. So when you change the number of molecules, all bets are off. So that's we got to have that little caveat in there. We're talking about a set number of molecules. And so we come up with this idea of the root mean squared. And I cannot explain to you why the variable for this is a U and not a V. It's never made sense to me. I'm sure it's a physics thing that has escaped me. But what I do know is that the root mean square velocity is equal to the square root of 3, which is a constant, times R, which is a constant, times temperature and molar mass, which is a constant. So in other words, speed really does depend on temperature a lot. And so it, this just gives us a way to be able to figure out a molar mass if we have a sample of an unknown gas and we can collect some data on it and then we can figure out what it is or at least we can get some candidates for what it is based on its molar mass. So in this case, because we're talking velocity and we've entered the land of physics, we need to use the energy R, the 8.31 R, which is in units of joules per Kelvin mole. Joules per Kelvin mole. So 
This is not on the AP exam anymore, but you may see it when you get to college. So go ahead and fast forward with me if you want to, but I'm going to take you through it anyway because I just have this overwhelming obligation to teach you what you need to know so that in case you do make that score that gets you past this in college, that you don't go to the next course with holes in your knowledge. It almost rhymed, didn't it? All right, so velocity, root mean square variety, that's an R, root mean square, for um, the atoms in a sample of helium gas at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, helium weighs 4 grams per mole, because I need its molar mass, and that temperature has got to go to Kelvin, so I add 273, which is my good buddy 298 Kelvin. So this is equal to, it's just a plug and chug moment, 3, because that's what's in the formula. And then make sure you get the energy R in there. 8.31 joules per um, kilogram. Okay, Kelvin. Joules per mole Kelvin. What is giving me trouble here? Oh, the joule part. What is a joule? Um, I'm not going to put joule because that's not going to cancel out. So a joule is a kilogram times a meter squared over second squared and then 298 Kelvin. Remember that unit conversion type things are on a formula chart if you did need them. But again, this one's off the chart, off the uh, exam for the moment. So 4.0 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per mole. And why did I do that? Because I want to cancel that kilogram. So if I'd put in 4 grams, that wouldn't cancel and I'd be scratching my head. And then, um, so when we get this here, I also, it's mole Kelvin. Where did I come out with that? 8.31, oh, divided by mole Kelvin. I left that part off, didn't I? So all of that was the numerator. So my Kelvins cancel, my moles cancel. See, units are your friend. I caught my mistake. And so now I just need to actually um, plug and chug, and I've got it all set up correctly. So three times, and this isn't my 0 0.0821. This is the 8.31 energy R times 298 divided, I'm going to get that answer, divided by 4 second e e minus 3, well, that's not an e, second e e, try that again, there we go, that's better, equals, and that's the, what's under the radical, but I need the square root, don't I? So second square root, and go grab that, and paste it down here, and I get 1362 watts. 62. Note that the only units left standing were right here, and they're both squares. So when I take the square root of them, it comes out meters per second, which is delightful for a velocity. And so now what do I have? Um, how many sig figs? Let's go with, well, let's go with two, because all we got right there is that 25 degrees Celsius business. So that's going to become 1400 to 2 sig figs. That might have been a stretch. I might should have left it 1362, but I'm, I'm married to it now. I'm going to go with that. Um, so 1400 meters per second. So it's just a simple plug and chug. All right, so just a little bit more on this. Um, mean free path. The average distance that the particle travels between collisions is what the mean free path is, and it's way hey, small. So if we examine the effect of temperature on the number of molecules with the given velocity as it relates to its temperature, heat them up, speed them up again, then we get this distribution. And this is what I kind of led with earlier, talking about we get this graph. What I need you to be able to do is just think about what this really means. I've had a lot of students get confused. They see this tall peak and they think that's a large quantity. Well, it is if you're talking about the relative number of nitrogen molecules with a given velocity. But they're at a fairly low temperature compared to here and here. And so the way to actually interpret this is to drop that vertical line like you saw me do from the peak of each of the three bell-shaped curves. At that point, that point on the x-axis is what is representing their average velocity. And so you can see that the bells get squashed as the temperature increases. And you may see graphs like this on the AP exam. So what you have to be able to do is identify the highest temperature based on the shape of the graph. So the highest temperature is the one that's going to have um, this more even distribution right here. But 
is just so simple to just simply realize it's a bell curve. Drop that down and just read the x-axis. So if you're talking about um, the highest temperature, this is the winner. But if you're talking about with the greatest velocity, then that's our winner. So our final little concept here is Graham's Law of Diffusion and Effusion. Yes, I know they sound alike. We're going to explain the difference. Effusion is very related to diffusion, but diffusion is the term that's used to describe the mixing of gases. The rate of diffusion is the rate of that mixing. Effusion, a term you probably have never heard before, describes the passage of the gas through a tiny orifice. We're talking about this action right here. So this is like the act of moving from point A to point B in this little chamber, where we have gas sample over here, and we have lack of matter over here, and the lack of matter is what we call a vacuum. Not to be confused with the vacuum cleaner that you have at home. Different vacuum. The rate of effusion is, measures the speed at which the gas is transferred into the chamber. So the rates of effusion of two gases are inversely proportional to the square roots of their molar masses at the same temperature and pressure. In English, that means rate of gas 1 is divided by rate of gas 2 is equal to the square root of the inverse of their molar masses. So remember that rate is a change in a quantity over time. It's not just the time. So we're not going to get, like, it took 12 seconds out of this. We're going to get velocities out of this. All right, so what they want us to do here is calculate the ratio of the effusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride, a gas used in the enrichment process um, to produce fuel for nuclear reactors. So what I do when I think about this is I think about what are those molar masses. Well, the molar mass of hydrogen is 2, and the molar mass of UF6 is way bigger. I'll spare you figuring that out. It's 352 grams per mole, grams per mole. Hmm. Heavy one is slow. The light one is fast. That's just common sense. All right, so I'm going to, to structure this such that my rate of gas 1 over rate of gas 2 is going to give me the um, fast over the slow because that's equal to then the molar mass ratio of 2 to 1. So who is faster? Helium is faster. The rate of helium versus the rate of UF6 is equal to 352, and the grams per mole are going to drop out of this, over 2. I don't know why I wrote 4 grams per mole. Cancel, cancel. I love canceling. It makes me happy. All right, clear my screen. 352 divided by 2 equals second square root of that answer equals 13.3. So we want the ratio of the effusion rates. So what this means is that hydrogen, the fast one, the little, the little tiny one, hydrogen effuses. thirteen point three times faster than UF6. Now that's why I put the fast over the slow because when I'm finished my sentence makes sense. I, was, I have to scratch my head sometimes if I've just tossed them in there randomly and I get them backwards. That messes with me. Alright, let's see what they can do to me on this exercise. A pure sample of methane. You should know that CH4 is found to effuse through a porous barrier in, oh man, they gave me time. Not rate. Oh, there's another time. Oops. 4.73 minutes. Can we agree this is fast? And this is slow? I think we can agree on that. So what do they want? They want under the same conditions an equal number of molecules of the unknown gas fuses through the barrier in 4.73 minutes. What's the molar mass of the unknown? Alright, so I'm still going to do the whole rate 1 
over rate 2 business and I want this to be fast so therefore this is my methane and this is my unknown it was a lot slower and that's equal to the inverse of my slow over my fast okay so to get a rate I need to make some assumptions so I'm going to assume I've got a mole of each of these is there any reason I can't do that under the same conditions okay well I'm going to assume I'm one mole then one mole for that one and a half minutes that's my rate one mole gotta be a fair fight right over the 4.73 minutes, my minutes will cancel, is equal to the molar mass of the slow, which is my unknown, over 16.05, because that's the molar mass of methane. 12.01 plus 4.04 is 16.05. So let's see what we can clean up about that. Let's just try it in the calculator. 1.5, take the reciprocal divided by 4.73 and take the reciprocal of that and that gets my whole left side so this whole left side is 3.15 because moles minutes all cancel out so it's just a naked number and that's equal to the molar mass of my unknown over that 16.05 make my radical come down far enough and so can't I just square both sides and multiply so I'm going to square what I got sitting there at my 3.15 and then cross multiply by the 16.05 and I didn't get the zero in there did I? that would be terrible and I come out with I'm not going to put it equals there for molar mass of the unknown is equal to 160 to two sig figs is that good? They gave me three, dang it. 160 with a decimal after it. All right, so again, I say these last two problems are not particularly on the course outline anymore um, since the redesign, but it's still an important piece of your understanding if you make your score. So those for those of you that are still listening, um, I just didn't want to send you off to college without knowing that these things exist, that there's another gas law called Graham's Law and how you deal with it. It wasn't like it was difficult. I don't know why they took it off. It's kind of common sense. Heavy molecules move slowly. Light molecules move quickly. Pretty easy. So these are some more animation kind of things of some of the gas laws, but I made a separate recording that put all the animations together in one place. It's, you know, it's worth a few minutes of your life you'll never get back. And some of it's kind of cool. If you can imagine imploding a can, like you've ever seen anybody crush a soda can with air pressure, yeah, some of the video I found does it like with big giant railroad car tankers. I mean, I mean, it's quite, quite the implosion, shall we say. All right, so real versus non or, or non ideal gases versus real gases. Again, this is just something you need to know for college. It's not on the AP exam anymore. But there is something called the Van der Waals equation that actually corrects for all of these assumptions that we've made. So when you when we talk about PV equals nRT and we've made all these assumptions that the molecules themselves don't have any volume, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there is an equation that corrects for that. I'm not going to work a problem with it. I just want you to know it exists in case you ever find yourself needing to be able to look it up. So coefficients A and B are called Van der Waals constants. They're not the same number, so they're two different constants. And again, no need to work it. It's the concept that's important here because intermolecular forces do exist. They actually lower the actual pressure because molecules are attracted to each other from time to time, thus they're not independent species colliding with the walls of the container, and that's what you're correcting for. And then their molecules do have volume, so we need to correct for that assumption as well. So it corrects the container to be a smaller free volume. And then you may see some graphs like this. You just need to be able to interpret them. If you take PV over NRT, that's a perfect 1.0. And so you can see the conditions where that holds true for these different gases. And as you might imagine, the heavier the gas, the more it deviates. 
And we've talked about that before. So hydrogen being one of the lightest gases on the planet pretty quickly deviates, but back here when the pressure is zero, everything acts fairly ideal. All right, so the more the pressure we have, the more the change in what's going on. But just notice that hydrogen is stays above the the um, ideal threshold. I don't have a better word for that. This this line right here, and then note that ni that nitrogen kind of comes down below it and then crosses over here into ideality at around 300 atmospheres of pressure. And so you're talking about ridiculously high pressures here. But just be able to interpret these graphs. And then just don't underestimate that the power of understanding these. We love to ask questions comparing the behavior of ideal and real gases. It's not likely you'd be got asked an entire free response question, but there's going to be pieces of it sprinkled throughout. Sprinkled throughout the multiple choice and sprinkled throughout the um, free response. And as I mentioned before, there is all of these different little YouTube videos of different demos and things that make this way more fun are out there in case you would like to um, explore those. I made a separate recording with all of those and narrated a little bit of it and some of it was set to music already so it's a little more entertaining than me. So just in case you're the kind of person I am, it has always bugged me is what is R? What does R stand for? Why is it an R? Why isn't it something else? It's this. I know it's called the ideal gas law or the ideal gas constant and I can accept that and learn that and use it but I just really want to know why it's R. Kind of like I really wanted to know what the P on pH meant. Well, it means potential. It means electric potential. Because this H is a positive proton, essentially. And so when you move positive charges or negative charges, you get a separation of potential energy, potential electric energy, not the gravitational that you know and love. And so I just need to know these things. So if you care, stay with me. If not, I hope you have a great rest of your day. So this is the kind of stuff, like I said, that drives me crazy. So it's a history lesson. Clausius, who is one of the scientists, there's a clausius clapeyron equation that you'll encounter later in your scientific endeavors, but it was the mid-1800s, and Clausius um, refined that conversion factor for converting degrees Cal Celsius to Kelvins. In other words, it, we, you know it as 273.15. In your lifetime, that 0.15 part's probably going to change, but it was 267. So he did a lot of experiments, and zeroed in and polished up and honed in on a better value for that conversion. And he did so by using careful experimental data of another scientist named Renault. I believe that's how you would say that. And so there's my R. He also noted that Renault's data indicated that the farther the temperature and pressure conditions were from the condensation point of the gas, the more correctly the ideal gas applies. And so it, there is speculation that the constant was assigned the letter R. Note the word speculation. That means it's not recorded anywhere in the history books that I could find to honor his work. And so in the spirit of giving credit where credit is due, I did not do all this research and look all this up. I stumbled upon, using my good friend Google, a little article where the Journal of Chemical Education written by William B. Jensen, who is at the Department of Chemistry in the University of Cincinnati at Cincinnati, Ohio at the time of that publication, um, is the one who actually put that into print. And so I am grateful because these things bother me. So the last thing I want to do is run through just a little bit of visualizations for you on this. And again, if, you've, if you're still listening with me, this might be something that you're, you might enjoy. All right, so here, this is Boyle's Law. We've got 50 liters of volume, one atmosphere pressure, 300 Kelvin. We're going to increase the pressure by putting that weight on. Watch the gauge. Gauge is going up. Note the volume is not changing. The temperature is not changing. Now the volume is decreased by half. The pressure has doubled. Boyle's Law. Now we're going to heat the sample of gas. 25 liters, one atmosphere. Heat them up, speed them up. Collisions get far more energetic far many more collisions. Hmm, what happened? Double the temperature, keep keep the pressure the same, you have to double the volume. It goes back up to 50. Alright, so now we're going to increase the temperature again, keep the volume constant in this big giant container, so now they move a lot faster. This one you may need to see again. See how slowly they're moving? We heat them, we're going to increase this temperature, 600 Kelvin. The 
pressure increased, heat them up, speed them up. There are more energetic collisions. Now we're just going to crowd the container. This is Avogadro. If you want to keep that at one atmosphere, then you have to let there be more room, twice as many particles to run around and, com and uh, collide with the container. As always, thanks for your kind attention, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.